DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Elizabeth Lev, who is an art historian living in Rome, where she teaches Baroque and Renaissance art, as well as Christian art and architecture at Duquesne University. She's the author of The Tigress of Four Leaves, and also co-authored The Roman Pilgrimage, The Station Churches, with George Weigel. With Elizabeth Lowe, we go inside the pages of How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, The Triumph of Beauty and Truth in Counter-Reformation Art, published by Sophia Institute Press. Liz, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I, you know, you may not realize this, but I've been waiting for this book from you for years and years and years. I have been a big fan of your work, your articles, and I am thrilled that How Catholic Art Saved the Faith is out and available for folks today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Wow, that's great encouragement. Well, the thing about it that's so fantastic is that it is maybe a textbook for the masses literally, your writing, it is generous in its subject matter, and it's easy to read. It also is kind to those that you speak of that may not necessarily be Catholic. So when you're describing the Protestant Reformation and where they came from, you're giving how they were formed in their circumstance. So it's not really an anti-Protestant viewpoint, but it is one that helps us give it a perspective of history. Well, I think, first of all, I I was really trying to take my inspiration from the people of that age, from the sort of, if you will, the heroes of the late 16th century, who instead of just wading in with name-calling and polemic with polemic, really tried to affirm and teach, and really trying to remind people that there's a reason why there is this 1500, at the time, 1500-year-old tradition, and, and how much imagery plays a part in not just teaching, but delighting while teaching. This is a, this is a joyful religion. Art is a beautiful and joyful thing, and so what better way to convey our, our messages? And, and I think the second thing that really was important to me was the uh, as I was working on this series of articles for Alatea that would eventually become this book, it it, it became it was it was inspired a great deal by the concern um, regarding the tone that we Christians or even we Catholics were taking among ourselves, and that there seems to be a, a need for us to have a way to talk to each other to understand where our positions come from but to be able to discourse again, not using uh, headlines that are intended to capture people's attention and rile their sentiments, but using works of art that are meant to soothe and please. So the, 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 that was really the idea behind this project. This is a period, and just for, for the listener to understand, that is during the time of what we would term the Protestant Reformation, But you've given it a term, I think, that is really key. It's more the Catholic restoration. And taking it from that viewpoint is essential, isn't it? I think so. I, this is something that's almost like a, it's attempt to bring an inside baseball out into the mainstream, but people who work in the late 16th century Catholic culture, uh, many of them prefer to use this word Catholic restoration because it's not a word that Catholic, the, the counter-reformation uh, su- suggests that the Protestant Reformation is giving the marching orders to the Catholics, that everything is a reactive, oh, the Protestants are doing this, oh my goodness, we should do this. But instead, the idea of Catholic restoration is really a representing, a reaffirming of beliefs that the that the Catholic Church held long before uh, the age of Luther. And so it was, uh, it, it, is, it is a term that I think is helpful in just reaffirming the value and the beauty of the, the the Catholic culture. So that was part of the reason why, especially in the introduction, I wanted to make a point that this is this period of the late 16th century is a period that we're going to be talking about. And, and one more thing about that period, and this is a very important thing in my mind, after the Protestant Reformation, which begins technically on de- October 31st of 1517, mm-hmm. um, with Martin Luther's famous 
uh, nailing up of the 95 theses on the Cathedral of Wittenberg, uh, there's a long period when it's not a done deal, right? Mm -hmm. People aren't necessarily defining themselves as Protestants yet. So this, this, there's, there's a lot of room to try to talk to people, to try to reconvince them of the truth of the Catholic faith. So it's, a, it's an exciting period with a lot of opportunity. And look at all the great saints that come out of that age. Oh my gosh! I mean, it's like a it, it's like a who's who of holiness. I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, you bring forward such stars as Ignatius of Loyola, Philip Neri, Teresa of Avila, Charles Borromeo, Robert Bellarmine. I mean, we get to see them in a context that is so different than how some hagiographies kind of portray them or are simple little hits on, you know, here's the saint's life and it's done in a minute. No, you put them in the context of how they even influence us today. A friend of mine a long time ago, when we were walking down one of the streets in Rome, we were leaving the Jesu, which is the church built for St. Ignatius as the, as the mother church of the Jesuit order. And he said to me, can you imagine what it was like to be walking down this road 400 years ago? And there would be, you might see St. Ignatius scurrying along with a letter in his hand from Francis Xavier on his way to see St. Philip Neri and read to him the latest news. Mm -hmm. what, a, what an amazing period, especially in the city of Rome, when you think of all the extraordinary men and women who were walking up and down those same streets. And that's really one of the things I, I found so beautiful in the story. You, you see them more more like like people. Charles Borromeo, who's interested in architecture. Uh, a Bishop of Bologna, who's interested in painting. Uh, 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 Philip Neri, who wants to create stories about the saints that are engaging. It's, it's a fascinating age. You're going to make me jump all the way to part three of the book, <laughs> only because it, you talk about the city of Rome. And I don't know if many of us realize if you've made a pilgrimage or you've or made a trip to Rome, that this is the Rome that St. Catherine of Siena experienced, St. Francis of Assisi. It doesn't look like it does today. It was in this period that you cover that even the city of Rome was designed in such a way to foster a, a communion of spirit, as it were, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I think one of the most underappreciated things on the part of a modern tourist, which was certainly appreciated by the contemporary pilgrims, is that in the late 16th century, the concern for uh, pilgrims people who were coming to Rome to reaffirm their faith, to be closer to the site of where St. Peter died or where St. Paul was buried. Uh, the city transformed between basically 1580 and 1650. The city transformed to accommodate pilgrims and to really uh, 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 awaken their faith, and, and sometimes in very, very practical things. Imagine showing up in the northern gate of Rome, a big old city inside an 11 mile circuit of walls. You don't have a GPS on your phone, and they're not handing out free maps at the internet information. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You have to get to a bunch of church and churches in order to get to your indulgence and to leave the prayers that you promised for the people you left behind. you got to figure out how to get point A to point B. And mm -hmm. this this crazy Pope Sixtus V puts in, drives a series of straight roads through the city, and then at high visual points, he puts these big granite obelisks that were taken by the Romans from Egypt mm. 1,500 years earlier. So they become like, like pin drops. In a, in a Google map, and you can find your way around the city through these kind of these, these different points. So then we put in these fountains to refresh the pilgrims. We bring Caravaggio and we stick in his paintings in the main pilgrim groups. This city, it was built to awaken faith. The experience you just outlined, I wish could be the pilgrimage experience for most people, because unfortunately, if you a modern day pilgrim, as it were, were to be a part of a pilgrimage group, you're on a bus and you're jumping from one point to the next. You miss out on that in some ways because, I mean, you've seen their faces, I'm sure. When the modern day pilgrim goes in, they're hurried through these magnificent moments and these encounters with the, the, this art. And they're just so overwhelmed. There's, they can't speak. 
their jaws just drop and it almost has to seep into them and they have to remember it days afterwards. What, what, what happened with the great moment of the Counter-Reformation or the Catholic Restoration, which led into the Baroque era, is that as of the 18th century, we began to get a new type of visitor alongside the pilgrim, which would be the tourist. Mm. And so for the last 200 250 years, we've seen the development of the city around tourism versus around pilgrimage. And then now in the era of, of mass travel, this idea of picking several different places. So I need three days in, in, in Venice, uh, two days mm -hmm. in Florence, uh, the day in Assisi, and three days in Rome. It, it doesn't allow for its, um, its, it is a sensory overload as we try to tick things off instead of deepen our knowledge of a place. That was not the case of pilgrimage in the day. We're talking with Elizabeth Liv about her book, How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, The Triumph of Beauty and Truth in Counter-Reformation Art. And when you speak about pilgrimage, I have to say, because it has changed so dramatically, having this book helps assist in even those who can't make that journey to make that pilgrimage, that journey of love that you describe. I, I am so happy you use that terminology because that's truly what someone who's called to a pilgrimage, that is a journey of love, isn't it? It, it it always has been. It's it's very similar to the uh, getting on a plane. The, the difficulties that one undergoes to get on a plane or a bus or drive to see or surprise family. That idea of journeying someplace to be there in person, which you do out of love, is best and most beautifully expressed in pilgrimage, which we see crisscrossing all of Europe down into the Holy Land from time immemorial. I mean, people have been traveling since the days of days of St. Paul, really. And so so the idea of making a journey and, and the value of that journey, not only in the sense of I get out of it an affirmation of my faith because I'm staying in the spot where Peter was buried, but also that opportunity to show for us, show on our part how much we appreciate our gratitude for that extraordinary Jesus, that journey when God became man, when God came into our world and lived in our time. So it's, it's really, it's a, it's a great activity and an action to show love. And that's, I think, what your book does, Liz, and it facilitates that journey. And, and actually, I think what we can call it is conversion, because in someone who will pick up this work, uh, How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, I'm going to say it a lot because I want people to, I think it's the best book of, of this year, if not this decade. I, and I'll tell you why, because it's what we need right now, because there is, like it was back in that day, there is a time right now where there is a real challenge, a real struggle, just as those early uh, pilgrims of that era, they, as you said, they may not have understood why the sacraments were important or, or what was the significance of this particular moment or why do we do things. That's what they tried to help them to understand then. And that's what you articulate so clearly through this journey of the book. I think that our age, just like the age of the 17th century, loves stories. People love stories. How often do you sit down with someone who turns to you and says, so what's your story? Everybody loves stories. Mm -hmm. In our day and age, television and cinema have made a tremendous industry out of telling stories. But the stories are mm, sometimes redemptive, but oftentimes not what the stories told in the lives of the saints and in the art produced to celebrate the lives of these saints were, were stories of people who have the arc of uh, sinfulness, the arc of being on the wrong path, the arc of finding oneself, one's identity with the Lord, and then ultimately achieving this, these great and extraordinary things which the great saints do. So what the church did was to put in front of people who love stories, stories that were edifying, stories that were inspirational, and stories that were mostly, most importantly, beautiful. And what better way to do it than with art? In this book, too, you have it in three different sections. There's first, it goes through the sacraments, which is just glorious. I love this. And it's one of the most interesting catechisms I've ever gone through. And then you also talk about, and the second part is on intercession, where you talk about the angels and you, and Mary and and so I love the mystic union 
section. I'm doing this real quick because I, I also want to emphasize the fact in that storytelling that you, you, you bring us, we've already mentioned the holy, holy, holies, those great saints, but those people, those artists, you know, whether it's Caravaggio or an artissimus or, and I may say their names wrong, so please jump in and correct me, but their stories are, they're not perfect people, are they, Liz? No, that was, that's always been a tremendous attraction to me about these artists. Um, these people who are so, in the case of Caravaggio, the, the other artist, Artemisia Gentileschi, is a woman whose life was fraught with scandal. But for some reason, the church did not see fit to kick her to the curb. They harvested and they encouraged the talents of both a Caravaggio and an Artemisia and many others who were deeply problematic and allowed them to produce something good out of their lives. So instead of condemning them and confining them to the part of their lives that was sinful, Mm-hmm. They encouraged a route for these people to do something redemptive with their lives, which is using this exceptional talent that was given to them at the time understood to be given by God in order to return or repay God in one way or another. And I, I find that, I think, one of the most beautiful things about writing these stories and working as an art historian in this field, I, I've always felt that these people always indicated to me that there was a chance, you know, no matter how sinful we are, no matter how many ways we may go astray in our lives, uh, these artists show that we can still be, we can still make something beautiful. And they really do physically make something beautiful. And we, with our lives, try to make something beautiful anyway to offer to God. This book comes out of um, a class, it's actually the, a lot of the thought of the structure of the book into three parts comes out of a class I've been teaching for 15 years Mm -hmm. at uh, Duquesne University. And it became very difficult to explain to students who are not necessarily Catholic or even so not very well informed of their faith, you know, how to classify this art. And so, yes, the idea of breaking the book into something very clear comes from this great experience of teaching where I just, you know, here are the sacraments and here's the problem and here art resolves it. Then here are the questions of intercession. And particularly, I agree with you, the mystic union is a, is, is a, is a very special thing that the Catholic Restoration puts front and center like don't you want to feel this too Mm -hmm. and then the last part is cooperation what can you do in an age of discovery an age of activity people want to participate people want to feel like they're stars of their own show as it were and so the church also responds to that with these great works of art it's stunning in its scope when you think about it because it what you've done here is for those who are in, in this particular period when we're very quick to cast people out, as you said, you know, kick them to the curb, it, it, it's like as though we, we need to take time and listen to those particular artists. What are they saying? What are they trying to communicate? And it may look different than what you've seen or heard before. And in many cases, in some of the, in the art that's been depicted here, this was, I, I, I don't think jarring's the right word I'm trying to look for, but it, it, it did stimulate a lot of thought and it challenged a lot, didn't it? I think you're absolutely right. Jarring is the word. It, it was, it was, if you will, uh, a, a woke art, to use the modern phrase. It was an art that was meant to awaken people to the immediacy of the call for conversion. As you were saying earlier, it, it is very much this age is about conversion. We talk about conversion in all the ages of the church, but in this period, there's a real call to you know, cleave the, or, or to return to the to the Catholic faith, and so um, conversion is a very big part of it. So when Caravaggio puts these unequivocal beams of light that slash through the murkiness, the darkness, and the convert and the, and the confusion to find its target, that's a very powerful call for people. The way that the painters in this period, engage the audience. Things seem to project into our space. Things seem to fall into our space. And, and Artemisia Gentileschi, you know, blood splattered as she, she's painting a blood splattered Judith as she's sawing off the head of Paul Bernie's, reminds us that combating sin is not not an easy thing. We don't get to do it sort of sitting daintily on the edge of a, in 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 a,
in a lovely little room when we when we have to fight sin and temptation it really sometimes feels like a big old dirty nasty wrestling match and so they they capture that vividness in a way that really does to this day capture people's imagination we'll return to inside the pages in just a moment Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chapel of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Inside the Pages. I kind of touched on a little earlier, I used the word uh, catechism. I I think what you've done here is you've opened a door to a catechesis of beauty. Because in a lot of these images, and the book is filled with gorgeous images to help be able to to feed your, that sense of your mind too, that other side of your brain, that in gazing upon them, we're, we look at them and we say, oh my goodness, but we don't have words for it. And, you know, they, there's a sense of this beautiful, but I can't articulate why. And you, so poetically in some cases, you know, and, 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 and throughout the entire book, you gently guide us into that. Oh yeah, that's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm understanding. Those type of moments. And so it, it, it's really compelling, Liz. Well, I I have to say I'm I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful to Sophia Press Institute for the beautiful layout of this book. I, I only touched my own copy a few days ago, and I was amazed by just the incredible work they did to make the pictures stand out as I was writing it. I was wondering to myself, are the pictures going to look good or is this good? So this is a wonderful collaborative effort on the part of the publishers who really, how they did, they did everything possible to make my words, make my words look good as it were. And then I think insofar, this art was, was made for teaching. This art was made for uh, teaching gently, uh, teaching sometimes in a fun way, uh, but it was meant to help explain and clarify the doctrine of the church. And so really it's just a question, and, and wonderfully, the artists aren't theologians, so I'm comfortable with them. I don't need a degree in theology or philosophy because these artists didn't have them. What they do is they create images, they compose figures in a meaningful way. So my job is to be able to see 
the composition, the meaning in their composition, and then explain that at 500 years distance, not many people have spent the past 30 years studying it, but it's wonderful to see that they speak today with the same power that they spoke 500 years ago. And what's so beautiful about the in images of this particular time, they do give us a tableau. I mean, it, it's almost a way of communicating the Catholic social teaching, as odd, again, as odd as that may sound, because it is always about a communion. There's always others affected, and they're always, it seems, affected by Christ. And it's, you know, how are you going? Are you going to turn away? Are you going to look? Are you going to participate? Are you going to, I mean, where are you in these images? And that's different than what the art that was affected by the Protestant Reformation, how that changed that particular styling. Am I correct in that? Yes, that's actually a really, really nice, it's a really nice analysis of it. Uh, the, uh, the art of the Catholic Restoration does expect you to do something. So, for example, going back to uh, going back to Caravaggio, let's say, uh, Caravaggio gives you an image of the entombment where Jesus' mm -hmm. body is front and center in the middle of the canvas. It's being lowered, and the whole composition makes you look down, not up. If if your if your listeners um, notice when you usually look at a painting, the composition draws your head upward, but Caravaggio tends to draw your head downwards. Mm -hmm. At any rate. He draws your eye downwards to the very, very bottom of the canvas where he leaves a big empty space. And that big empty space, that awkward empty space, requires filling. It's like, it's like an atonal chord that requires a, a resolution. And so you, you, you feel yourself drawn into that space and you realize that the painting really is only complete if as an altarpiece, the figure of the entombment, Jesus' body descending downwards towards the altar, needs the priest to fill that opening, that, that, that space left in the painting. And so the, the, the thing about this art is it, much, it, it aggressively, aggressively uh, uh, challenges the viewer to, well, what are you going to do? Because what you do matters. You don't just sit back. You don't put your feet up and say, I presume I'm saved, so all is good. No, you make decisions about what you're going to do. And each one of those decisions shapes and forms you, making you faithful into a work of art yourself. Mm. You know, again, throughout the book, you show us how not only in the paintings of the time, but also in the sculpture, how that can be very transformative, really. I, I mean, I'll never forget the moment I walked in to Santa Cecilia, I, into St. Cecilia's Church in Rome, and I saw the actual sculpture that was commissioned upon their refinding. Is that, mm -hmm. <laughs> can I say that? They're refinding yeah. her incorrupt body. Yeah. Wow, breathtaking. It's a, it's a perfect storm that, uh, that Cecilia, ancient, ancient, third century martyr, aristocratic woman who is at this point being contested whether or not she existed. They find this, 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 this space in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, they find this burial space, they open it and they find her body uh, intact and looking like she's sleeping. So you have this mixture of, on one hand, a documented thing that happened with witnesses uh, attesting to the fact that her body was there and intact. But then you have the way that the artist Stefano Moderno shows us this extraordinary calm this peacefulness. So this woman whose death is really quite horrific. They try to suffocate her in her baths and then they try to chop off her head. They mm. don't succeed for free. But after this horrible death, that peacefulness, what an elegant, lovely, beautiful, peaceful figure. And really it gives us that a very strong visual of what that rest in peace means, especially when you are victorious as the martyrs are. And again, in the beginning of our conversation, I said, I'm going to have to jump to the part three. Now I'm jumping over to part one again, because in the section on the sacraments, I think the treatment that you give confession and how you've broken that up into a couple different chapters, explaining how in that moment, the response to why this time of penance is important, as opposed to what was being preached all throughout Europe in the various forms in the Protestant Reformation. 
I think in many ways this book began somewhere between uh, the uh, sacrament of penance or the sacrament of the Eucharist. It's, mm. it, it, the idea behind this book began somewhere in reading and learning about these two things. Everything from discovering that Charles Borromeo was the one who invented the, conf the confessional as we see them in the churches in Rome, that was his design to the extraordinary numbers of the images of Mary Magdalene. And maybe, uh, was it 10 years ago, when all of these silly novels and movies and historical oh, yeah. Magdalene things came out, and it sidetracked people from who Mary Magdalene was, in particular in the 17th century. She never got old. She's always been an art. She's very, very popular. But her 17th century persona, which is, is so constant as a penitent, and she's always portrayed as so beautiful, you begin to realize they, they put forth this extraordinary woman who's not only apostle to, to the apostles, but she gets to be the poster child for making, you know, confession look good so what else, what, what there's such amazing moments in uh, in the history of the church and and this 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 attack on confession perhaps the most bitterly attacked sacrament mm -hmm. was that of confession or the penance and so the church really they, they brought out the biggest guns they could to try to affirm and, and, and convince the faithful of the necessity of this of the sacrament so Mary Magdalene Saint Jerome, Peter, all come to the fore to really defend a sacrament that is in grave, grave danger then, and one could also argue potentially now. Yeah, poor St. Jerome, what a wreck. I mean, <laughs> you see images of him, and I mean that in all reverence. And what happened that, is it because of the that Protestant influence that churches in America, we just... And, and maybe I just don't get around enough, Liz, but you just don't see this type of artwork displayed in American churches. I think part of it has to do with a uh, sense of this art is a luxury. The art is somehow um, uh, a manifestation of an old uh, elitist system. So there is this, always a certain amount of... Um, uh, diffidence that remains towards the incredible artistic production. So people like to see it as sort of a, a museum, almost like it was an institutional supporting of the artists kind of public service thing, whereas it makes some people uncomfortable, and this does come from our uh, sort of Protestant constitution, the idea of the ornate churches. Um, so in part that 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 has drawn us away from a very active commissioning of art. But I think the other, um, the other thing is simply the period in which the United States is formed and the churches are built in the United States is a period when art is already, uh, the art that's seeping over from Europe has already become sanitized. And so instead of the full-throated proclamation of faith, which we have in Catholic Restoration art, we have an art that tries to emphasize more reason, a coolness, a calmness that at a certain point just becomes, uh, it looks like everything else and doesn't speak to people in quite the same way. Well, and it wouldn't speak to this culture right now. I mean, what you just described is not what we're experiencing, I think, in many forums. But we're talking with Elizabeth Liv of her book, How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, the Triumph of Beauty and Truth in Counter-Reformation Art. And again, I, I just want to emphasize, I think this book is an absolute uh, beautiful example of what, uh, I think it was Pope Benedict XVI, you quote him in your book, it says that art and the saints are the greatest apologetic for our faith. And that's exactly what you do with this. I mean, this is the book that you want to give somebody who is about to enter, maybe they're in an RCIA program or they're, or to anybody, it, it, young couples that are getting married. It, I mean, this is, every home should have this and not just as a decorative art book as this, it's on the, on a table, but something that is picked up because I, I guarantee it, you won't be able to put it down. I, uh, I was very, very inspired and particularly moved. Uh, during the pontificate of Benedict XVI and his Via Pulchritudinis, Benedict XVI from the very beginning. It was nice, you know, as an art historian, you're sort of feeling like you're on the fringes of everything, thinking, mm -hmm. well, you know, the real battle is out there in the front lines, the pro-life, pro-this. Like, yeah, I, I just know about pictures. And uh, 
Benedict, uh, Pope Benedict really opened a door for those of us who wanted to use our love and knowledge of art uh, to affirm the faith. And so I, the, the Via Pulcritudinis is a huge part of the mindset, uh, the, the, the way of beauty is what that means. Mm. So a form of persuasion and a form of evangelization that uses beauty. And I, I, I'm very grateful for the thrust that, that those years gave my work. I tell you, I mean, this book, even after those three parts, the lives of the artists, I, th- I thought that was, I didn't expect it when I got to the end and I went, oh, this is nice because mm-hmm. we end up encountering them and getting a little glimpses. And if you want to, you can explore their lives even more. But then also, I mean, my gosh, what a great bibliography. I mean, to continue on this particular journey that you've uh, set us on. So I really appreciate that too. Well, thank you. I really, as, as, a, as a teacher who writes a lot of syllabi, um, one of the things that often happens when you write books that involve, especially several hundred years ago in another country where everyone's name is Eni, Oni, or Ani or something, so it gets very confusing. Uh, I thought it would be nice if people would have a possibility to uh, look back and get a sense of who these people were. It turned out to be a much bigger project than I was expecting because I didn't really like the thumbnail sketches that you would find just anywhere. So I went back over their lives and tried to draw out what made them particularly um, uh, susceptible or fertile for producing um, great Catholic art. So it was actually, that was a bit of a labor of love there. And then, of course, I'm always hoping that people, this book, as much as I, I tried to put as much information as I could in, in how Catholic art saved the faith, there's where I got this and where this comes from. There's so much more to learn if you're interested. And so the bibliography was really meant to help further reading in whichever direction one might choose. Well, if I were to ask to give a blurb for this book, I would have to lift it from its pages, only to say that, as you said in the book, those who embarked on this journey of love were rewarded by finding a city organized for them when you were speaking about Rome. I would have to say those who embark on this journey of love will be rewarded by finding this book organized for them. I mean, it really, this, this is what you do. And I was in Rome for the Synod for Youth and where you heard this cry from young people, everyone I encountered, they just want to be listened to. They want to be understood. They're looking for, they're looking for beauty. They're looking for a way to encounter the faith in, in something very, very special. And I think that's why it's so important what you're doing, because I think that's the kind of apologetic they're questing for. Oh, I'm glad. I'm very, very glad to hear that. I, I really, this is comes out of years and years of teaching young people. I teach sophomores and juniors and, and, and watching them learn to, they aren't art historians. The uh, Duquesne students are maybe for the very first time they're abroad. And to watch this art open their eyes, make them more proud of themselves, as, as, as young people who are actors in, in their own history, but also uh, interested in the Catholic tradition or the students who are Catholic, proud of their tradition. I wish we had more time. Boy, do I really wish we had more time. But as a final thought, well, let me, let me phrase this way. Liz, do you have a final thought? I, have, I always have too many thoughts going <laughs> on. But um, I, my, my thought is the amazing parallel that I found in the art of the Catholic Restoration and our world, and particularly in the final section of how Catholic art saved the faith, there's a lot about cooperation and what we do to participate and to cooperate with with Jesus' Jesus's redemptive sacrifice. And there, I, I, it is amazing to find the role of women and the role of globalization and science. It's all there in the 17th century. We're already tackling it, except we tackled it so beautifully. And so really the, the way that God's time all sorts of all folds together into this one amazing tapestry was, I think, the great lesson of this book for me. Oh, and I, I have to add a footnote because I don't want to be I don't want this left out. The afterward where you help us to how can I implement this in my life today? And you can. You can begin to experience it and you give out practical steps to be able to implement it. I mean, that's why this book works on so many different levels. 
well, I was just channeling. I was channeling my old friends, the writers of the 16th century, the treatise writers of the day who wanted to not just inspire and inform, but also motivate people to continue the work that they started or the work that I started and to you know, bring it to greater and greater fullness. Hopefully there's an art historian out there who's going to pick this up and take it to places I couldn't have imagined. Elizabeth Love, you even inspired me to go back and read the, the documents from Trent. So <laughs> how about that? You even made us. You even made that sound great. So I'm gonna. I, I want to go back and I want to read those last sections because I I must have missed that because it, it it you make it sound so beautiful. I thank you so very much for your time and I just I hope for all the best. Thank you very very much. This has been such a delight. With Elizabeth Lev, we've gone inside the pages of How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, The Triumph of Beauty and Truth in Counter-Reformation Art. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to sophiainstitute.com, the website for its publisher, Sophia Institute Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, Visit discerninghearts.com or download the free Discerning Hearts app available on the Apple app or Google Play stores. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages insights from today's most compelling authors.